Hello and welcome to this holding space webinar. It's lovely to have your presence here today. My name is Jackie Shaw and I'm the Clinical Director of Sydney Centre for Creative Change. And this is the 15th in our series that we're offering during the pandemic. We have a special uh, panel today of two of our interns with Sydney Centre who've been working with us this year, supporting us on our workshop, workshop programs. And they're going to be speaking from their own personal experience about how to maximise inclusive practice. So I'm going to introduce those um, lovely ladies to you in just a moment, um, Em and Annie, and they're going to be talking about um, different ways to, um, based on their own experience in both health and education, to really maximise an experience of inclusivity. So we're very, very um, lucky to have them both generously presenting and speaking about their experiences today. I'd like to welcome you one and all here today and to also acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands that I come to you from today, the Eora people of the Gadigal Nation, and pay our collective respects to elders past, present and emerging. And especially welcome our Indigenous brothers, sisters and colleagues with us today. So welcome one and all. It's really lovely to have you here. We have today a recorded presentation and this is going to be edited and made available to yourself and others who might want to view it afterwards. If you'd like some professional development points or a certificate for uh, attending today, you can either view this again afterwards and in a couple of weeks, Aidan, who's our lovely admin assistant, he's going to give you a wave there. He's going to be uh, writing a quiz and if you can successfully complete that quiz, he'll send you a PD certificate. So without further ado, I'm just going to put up a slide, some slides just to orientate us to what we're doing today. So the reason I thought it might be good to have a focus today on inclusive practice is it's come again to the fore this year in a timely way with Black Lives Matter movements and on the back of the Me Too movement. I think when we're working in health, education and helping professions, it's really important to consistently review how we operate, what our assumptions might be for how we relate to others, how we welcome people, the sort of language we use and the sort of practices that we undertake. And there are many ways that we can stop with some humility and reflect on how we operate as humans in the human services professions. And one of the things that I wanted to offer today was just two voices in among a whole lot of voices that I think we need to hear at this time and, hoping, and I'm hoping we'll continue to hear in this and in other forums about what experiences have been in both inclusive and exclusive practice. Um, and as I mentioned, what we're going to be doing after we hear those two voices today, we're going to have a connecting in, a, a small breakout room opportunity, and then we'll do a prize giveaway. So I'd like to, um, to welcome our two guests today. Both of these guests are people who have been uh, working with us in a support capacity as part of our internship program, which will be relaunching at the end of this year, again for next year. And these people have generously come along today and volunteered to talk about their own personal experience in both health and in education settings of when they have and haven't felt um, included as part of a, a bigger process of what's happening and the importance obviously of doing that. Neither of these people, Em or Annie, are going to be talking about anybody else's experience but their own. So I would invite you to listen with respect and, and be prepared if you'd like to, to ask questions of either or both of them about their experiences after, you, um, after we hear them today. First of all, we're gonna hear from Annie Aram Shin. Annie is a final year student studying psychology and fine arts at UNSW. And she aspires to pursue these disciplines in her career to contribute to the betterment of empirical creative therapy, positive psychological interventions, and their applications, especially for adolescents. Annie's been working as an intern for us this year and fostering knowledge of and experience in professional and creative settings. Also an emerging Korean Australian artist, Annie explores psychological concepts and processes through abstraction in her art making process. As a student, Annie has experienced both inclusive and excluding educative practices based on perceptions of her race. And she's very generously agreed to share some of these with us today. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome you, Annie, to speak about some of your experiences. All right. 
Hello everyone, um, welcome and thank you very much Jackie for that introduction. Um, yeah, I guess a bit more about myself. My name is Annie Arabshin, as you've heard, and yeah, my personal experiences regarding inclusivity are mostly in educational domains and some mental health in a lot of the services I either received as a client myself or provided as a research, clinical research assistant. Um, yeah, I'm a Korean Australian. I immigrated to Australia in 2010, so about exactly a decade ago. And since then, I've lived in Western Sydney on the land of the Darug people on which I'm speaking to you from today. Um, yeah, to note, once again, my experiences shared today aren't very representative of the Asian or Korean immigrant experience. And I do not and cannot speak on behalf of those in similar cultural circumstances as mine. And yeah, I'll be speaking from my own unique experience with cultural inclusivity, particularly regarding my heritage and race um, in Australian education and clinical settings that I've been exposed to. Right. Um, yeah, so I've been involved and been exposed to very um, diverse inclusive practices and most of them overall looking back um, made very visible efforts and I'll elaborate on this. Um, yeah, they made little or had no trace of assumptions based on what was apparent of me, my skin, my apparent heritage, age, gender, or anything. And yeah, inclusive practices that I've been exposed to were very slow to speak in regard that um, they involved great listeners that didn't put words into my mouth, especially when I was struggling with the English language in my first initial years here in Australia. And yeah, they were very patient with me and would give at their best to understand what I say without trying to redefine it or define it for themselves. And yeah, overall, I felt that I was heard and yeah, I felt very respected, um, even as an immigrant who's struggling to communicate her ideas clearly. Um, yeah, and on the opposite end of that, they were very quick to apologize in potential instances of offense. And yeah, they were, they apologized in advance in case they made any offense. Um, and making just those really visible efforts to implement systematic change where needed. And some examples of uh, this that I've seen included intake protocols in some clinics or interview procedures or student surveys in academic settings. And more, spe more specific examples of this included, I guess, my university lecturers who deeply cared about my unique learning experience as an individual during um, private consultations and in open lectures, not just as another immigrant student, which is quite a big population in Australian universities. And I guess thirdly, for inclusive practices, they're very just welcoming, just in one word, just very welcoming. And it was very clear to me that inclusive spaces and practitioners have already dealt with a diverse client range and had no trouble continuously attracting and drawing in diversity. And this is, I guess, coming from my experience with different centers and clinics and research spaces as well. And you could just see it in um, the actions and words, how careful and caring someone was trying to be, um, even if they found it difficult and a bit challenging for themselves, I could sense that they were intentionally trying to make me feel welcome. Yeah. So I guess those, that's a summary of inclusive practices. And now heading off to the other side of exclusive practices that I've unfortunately um, been exposed to. Um, yeah, exclusive practices and environments for me were very heavily laid with assumptions drawn from my apparent background and heritage. Um, a key example of this initially um, as a high school student in Australia were English as second language classes or ESL classes. So this is back in early 2010, between 2010 and 2015. Um, yeah, ESL classes really, I guess, excluded me in a weird way and my colleagues from the standard classes with standard English curriculums that were run simultaneously. And yeah, they ironically voided me and my colleagues of the opportunity to truly catch up to the non-ESL classes, which I found was very interesting. And it was necessary for me to voice my concern to be transferred to the standard class and to actually try to catch up to the normal curriculum. And I guess overall in my early years here in Australia, I felt 
it was necessary for me to personally isolate from different Koreans to adapt and develop, develop a new tongue and yeah, just really, I guess, fit into this new culture. And yeah, I had to go to the extra, go the extra mile to, um, I guess, just really be a part of this community that I was um, exposed to and just face all the mental challenges from the efforts that I made to include myself in my Australian school or academia. And yeah, from that um, resulted, I guess, not fitting in as neither fully Korean or Australian. And I see myself as a product um, that's become a cultural hybrid. Um, yeah, so I feel that I'm sort of too Australianized when I'm in Korea and still various very Asian, very Korean when here in Australia. And I find that duality very interesting. Um, yeah, so I fit in, I guess, neither, but yet belonging to both at the same time. So oftentimes, I guess this can feel very isolating, but in many domains, it gives me an advantage to be flexible in my consumption of culture and practice, um, and practice the best sides of both cultures. And I guess definitely more flexibly empathize with others. Um, yeah, in more recent years, I've been in university and exposed to subtle and direct traces of racism as well, um, especially the assumptions within the classroom that come with my international mask and, <clears throat> sorry, catching people making assumptions that I was either born in Australia or that I'm a completely Australianized person with no experience in my mother country, whereas I've lived there for more than half my life. Um, yeah, and there's also that cultural label that follows me with my name, um, which I guess there was certain lectures where I was encouraged to um, use my English name rather than my Korean name for employability and approachability. Um, even things like including my address or suburb, it was um, something that I was encouraged to reconsider when I was writing my CVs or cover letters. Yeah, so direct and subtle traces of racism there. And overhearing fellow students making racist remarks or jokes about, I guess, Chinese international students in particular recently regarding the COVID situation. And yeah, receiving those derogatory looks um, when I wore masks in the initial period or just having that constant urge to withhold or avoid sneezing behind my mask, especially in classroom or laboratory settings during that initial um, lockdown period as well. Um, yeah, so those are some of the more, I guess, dis in the past and recently in the past um, experiences with exclusive um, environments. Yeah, so I guess it was a good opportunity for me to reflect as an individual, what can I be? And I guess for us all to be doing or doing less of to be more inclusive. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I guess a big part of what I felt from exclusive practices were assumptions. And I guess what, what can we be doing less of is making, not making any assumptions based on culture, race, gender, or anything really, and approaching every client or student on the same baseline as, I guess, a piece of blank canvas or borrowing Shrek's words as an onion that has unknown layers that are yet to be peeled. Um, yeah, and I guess an example of where this has gone wrong and assumptions have been made and they were hurt, uh, they hurt me would be when um, practitioners or educators or even friends assumed, um, I guess, mental health challenges based on the stereotypical experiences from my Korean heritage. So yes, yeah, specifically when discussing my anxiety issues with a practitioner or struggles in my studies with educators, they were very quick to assume that my parents put academic pressure on me and that was the likely source of my emotional and mental challenges when they really weren't and they were more, more self-imposed or environmentally induced. And yeah, those kinds of assumptions really came out on the surface and it told me instantly that they saw a part of me and my experiences through a filter and a label of me being a Korean or Asian. So that's that's an example of where making assumptions has gone wrong. Um, so yeah, how can practitioners and educators do, I guess, be inclusive? And 
I'm just really aware of how difficult it is to, I guess, not do something, especially not make assumptions. And yes, social psychology studies show that we are significantly biased towards our in-group and we have difficulties overcoming our assumptions of other race or culture. Um, yeah, so to make less assumptions, what we can do is um, be open-minded, keep open-minded, be flexible in, I guess, challenging our own assumptions of others and being constantly reminded that um, we or you know as little about the client as possible when you, I guess, especially first meet them and being aware about assumptions that may arise along the way of getting to know someone. Um, yeah, so I guess some of the few tips to reduce assumptions would be, I guess, once again, to treat each client or student as a blank piece of canvas or that undiscovered onion <laughs> and um, I guess a more practical tip could be um, yeah even not asking where your clients are from if especially if that piece of information isn't essential to I guess your services or practices um, yeah I've heard um, privately from some friends that um, it's very apparent that if the issue in discussion has no relevance or um, I guess just no it does it wouldn't benefit from knowing their cultural backgrounds um, yeah some clients may instantly lose a part of their rapport build with the clinician and find themselves asking why that information matters so i guess if there is a situation where um, you find yourself asking your client where they're from just asking yourself once again um, if a client describes themselves of being a certain background or heritage does that mean they necessarily experience the issue at hand differently, whether that be a mental health problem, a breakup or trauma. So just asking those questions, why am I asking these things and do they actually benefit my client in the end? Um, yeah, another thing would be to not um, let clients' names that have clear apparent um, cultural origins or backgrounds to create assumptions for you before you meet them, especially, which could, I guess, unwittingly shape your interaction with them when you actually do get to meet them in person. And one more would be to pay extra attention to um, details while in consultation that might come off as minor or typical of their background. I think they're very important to prevent invalidating challenging experiences, especially, I guess, for Asian, Asian immigrants was for me personally yeah that's what I felt um, and some more tips on language just being very careful and aware of using language that may have self-centered Eurocentric male or female or cis-centric nuances or nuances of any kind in general um, they're really key to establishing rapport respect and empathy and just really screening constantly what type of languages do you tend to use and yeah, do these really help who I'm interacting with? And I think I mentioned this before when I was sharing, um, but not putting words in clients' mouths. I think that's very, very important. And that's a hotspot for assumptions to emerge, I think, especially if your clients struggle with communicating due to language barriers, or they might have, I guess, established skepticisms from cultural differences between um, themselves and you as the practitioner um, yeah and tip three might be um, acknowledging and apologizing especially um, acknowledging in advance the practitioners or your own flaws or lack of cultural understanding um, rather than I guess winning the client over with skills or qualifications and yeah an example of this might be verbally acknowledging that one might lack understanding of certain aspects of the client's culture or the unique experiences that come with say family dynamics of their culture would be extremely helpful, I think. And acknowledging that you will try your best to understand the circumstances despite the differences that are very apparent. And yeah, acknowledging mistakes and apologizing for assumptions that were acted upon or verbally expressed yeah, these could really jeopardize your connection with your clients. And I feel like, yeah, just being very open that you've made the mistake and you're um, genuinely sorry and you'll try your best to overcome making those assumptions in the future. And yeah, that really establishes a mutual open communication. Um, yeah.
And I think that would be crucial for listening as well. Um, and I guess a final tip would be the physical space of your practice. So I feel that every step in the process of seeing a mental health or health professional really matters from the first encounter with a website or on a Facebook ad or initial phone call to the physical space of the practice, every step really matters. And I guess even simple physical things like posters or informative pamphlets that show direct and physical support of inclusivity for all races, backgrounds, genders. And yeah, these could really just indicate your practice as a safe space and make clients feel more, um, I guess, not alone in their experience and safer to open up and voice their concerns when they're actually there with you. And yeah, I guess these could be applied to your websites or your therapy space and having, I guess, a corner where you can have um, informative links on, uh, I guess, different experiences for all kinds of, um, all domains of diversity, I guess. Um, yeah, I think that's it for me. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Annie. It's a very generous sharing about your own personal experiences of inclusivity and exclusivity in education and in health. And I think those great messages about providing safety and specific things that we can do to be more inclusive are, are really very valuable. And if you do have any specific questions for Annie, please jot, jot them down. You can put them in the chat box if you think you, you might want to remember them that way or just write it on, on a piece of paper because we'll open it for questions after Anne's presented as well. I wanted to, um, again, just share <clears throat> a screen to be able to introduce our next wonderful speaker to you. Now, not only is Em very generously giving her time today um, to share with us, but Em Christelle is also having a birthday today. It's her 60th birthday today. So I'd like you to um, give her a special round of applause. Um, and uh, if you want to write any happy birthday messages to Em in, I'm sure she'd appreciate those in the chat box. Em is um, a special person and she's been, um, uh, doing support work in on our internship program for the last couple of years now and it's been always invaluable having you in the room and with us you knew at age four who you were but didn't know anyone like her this was Em's experience she had no language to speak about it and kept um, who she was her private and treasured secret because Em is female in a transgender body as an adult, she finally shared openly about her inner world in psychotherapy groups. She found it liberating from the pain of oppression, loneliness and inauthenticity. And there are also new challenges to face in her psyche and in society. Insights from Em's story will assist us in both health and education and caring in understanding how to support transgender people in facing many challenges and creating a life of optimal well-being. So Em's going to be speaking from her own experience and I know you'll be listening with respect and with regard to everything that you've got to say today Em. So thank you so much for being here especially on your birthday. Thank you. <clears throat> well I hope you have a happy birthday on my birthday as well. Thank you. There are many, many different ways to be transgender. And if we look at the media, we pick up, like with anything, we pick up all kinds of stereotypes and how people should be. <clears throat> I know some transgender people um, and they have their stories to share. And when I hear their stories, I do find some similar, similar themes and sometimes similar experiences. And there are also differences. And as I read books and learn about it as well, people have their own journey. And so I'm going to share, first of all, I'll just share my story of knowing and awakening and dealing with it. And there's many different health and caring and educational professionals involved. There are things that have been done that have helped me to thrive and shine. There are things that in our society that make me want to shrink and hide and even want to die because it can be very tough. Just putting a little context in first, I've seen studies that have come from America. I've had them quoted in Australia and I'm not sure whether they were just quoting America or whether they're from here. 
but they were about young transgender people and the rates of attempted suicide and somewhere around 40 to 46 percent um, had attempted suicide and it's a very tragic thing and then there's the ones that wish to die and don't get reported and um, there are those who are opposed to transgender people and there are those out there and in the last few weeks I've been part of a massive attack with um, it's gone to 200,000 people and many of them are anti-transgender groups that have done a big attack on me and an organization that accepts me so it's like it's vicious and ferocious and thankfully there are many many who are really welcoming and loving and then many neutral but um, as I read the statistics, what they showed was that if a young person, and these statistics were with young people that I read, but it would be for any age, if they had parents and family who were accepting and loving, the rate of attempted suicides dropped significantly. If they have school and or workplaces that are accommodating, accepting and welcoming and not bullying, it drops significantly. If they live in a community where it is safe for them to be who they are without threat of violence, physical, emotional, mental, social, spiritual, the rates of attempted suicide drop and drop and drop. You see, I think that's pretty much the same for everyone. When we are safe, when we are loved, when we are accepted, our quality of life and our willingness to want to be engaged in life in this world increases. And so we have to look, it's not just a thing that an individual has to deal with, it's a societal thing. And each one of you, um, I'm pretty sure, has found to some degree some kind of marginalization or discrimination or abuse in some way. And you know what it's like to not feel safe, whether it's a little bit or huge. And um, being the caring professionals that you are, I just know and assume that you are ones that want to create more safety, more love, more kindness, more room for people in our world. And then we can all thrive and flourish so much more. So going back to my story, I've come across transgender people that one transgender woman, it was the first time she came to the gender centre in Sydney, had taken the courage for a long time, had only just come out to her wife, had known for maybe about 10 years. Um, but that was it. There are those who only more recently know. For me, I was about four, from what I can gather, three or four. I was with my mother. And it was in the back of a church, in a church hall. I remember it was carpeted, there were chairs in a circle and the women had gathered. And I was a child there with my mum, probably playing on the floor, I don't know. I can't remember what was happening, but I don't have a sense that it was a religious meeting. I seem to think, and it's a long time ago, but it's like yesterday that I was there. But it was like somebody who was doing stuff in the community services or overseas or something. A woman was coming and visiting. It was a special occasion and sharing with these women about her work in the world of compassion and kindness. But I remember being there in the women's circle and it was like, this is where I belong. I remember from then on and know that this is a child mentality with child knowledge and me reflecting as an adult back. But I watched the way men were in the world. I watched my dad. And it was like, how much as a child and growing up, I can't do this. This is not me. I didn't have it as a sense about my body at that stage. It was around the spirit and roles. And I know there's going to be some stereotypes in there of, you know, what women do this and men do that. And I understand all of that. But I can remember thinking, I want to be the one that's here with the babies. I want to be here with the kids at home. 
and they talk first and they take their walks and do all of that. Um, there were so many other things too when I watched it. I noticed the differences in bodies between women, men, from the outside appearance. But you know, this wasn't a fantasy. It wasn't like, I wish I'd grow up to be a woman. I had this knowing without any evidence that when I grow up, I'm going to be a woman. I remember the pain and the agony around puberty, the certain things developing certain ways in the body. And it just wasn't right. The outside wasn't working on what the inside was. There were things that I would do and think and be that would be like, oh, when I do this, I feel like the girl that I am. I remember at high school, walking along and watching the way different people walk. I remember noticing different ways that not all, but lots of the girls carried their books in a different way. When I held the books in that way, in my body, I just relaxed and it's like, I'm home in my body. When I tried to be the way that was more likely how the boys did things, it was jarring and it didn't work. This is really shocking, but I'm guessing that you would know how often with kids and um, a put down to boys would be, you're such a girl, don't be a girl, all of that kind of thing. And how horrible that is that that's used as a put down. But if ever that was used against me, it was inside, it was like, yes, they think they're insulting me, but that's the most beautiful thing. Um, and that carried on into adulthood as well. I, as a child and as a teenager, we grew up without television. This was the 60s and 70s, where there wasn't a lot of media, there wasn't internet. The places I lived were very homogenous societies. Nobody talked about these kinds of things. I'd never heard of anyone that thought like me, but I did know that it wasn't safe to talk these things. Nobody talked about gay and lesbian or any of the LGBT. Um, but somehow I knew that it wasn't an okay thing to open up and share with anyone. When I was, I think it was 16, in the Reader's Digest, they had just a little short article about it was the 20th year since Sir Edmund Hillary climbed Everest with 23 or 24 people on the team. And they just said they've had a reunion and here's what it was like after all these years. And they said the original team, and let's say it was 24, I can't remember the exact number, there were 24 men that climbed Everest. When they came together, there was 23 men and there was one woman, Jan Morrison, I never knew who Jan Morrison was till I read an article about a biography or autobiography last year, but I never forgot her name. Inside me thrilled. There's somebody else out there that's like me. And I knew I couldn't talk that in the church world. And it's one of those things that I just knew that that would be seen as sick and perverted and against the natural order, but that was society as well. I don't know how I knew that something must have been said about some of those kinds of things. To me, that wasn't, wasn't yucky and wrong. That was the most beautiful thing. I never heard anything more for a long, long time. It wasn't something talked about. It wasn't something seen. And growing up in a world without television and not reading lots of the popular magazines other than you know nature things and science things, I didn't pick up on all of those types of things. So when I was 21, I went as a volunteer to Pakistan as a teacher for a year. And we were going through a community in Karachi one day, one Sunday, and we're walking through and I saw these very tall women, very beautiful women, more makeup than others, the clothes were outstanding. And in Pakistan, there's many different cultural groups. And I know that there are some that come from the northern Pakistan, certain kind of tribal regions, 
and their skin was a different color and they were taller. I just assumed that these women came from one of those particular tribal groups. And somebody that was with me said, I just commented about how beautiful they were. And they told me that, um, and they used different words back then, but they told me, these are transgender women. And they were very openly together walking through. And I thought it was very beautiful and very special. My heart sang inside. I, um, I had lots and we won't go into all the details, but loads and loads of things. Imagine a jigsaw puzzle where there's all kinds of pieces scattered everywhere and you pull one and pull another and you start putting them together and then a picture emerges. Well, that's what it's like when I look back, I can see a thousand or more of all these little bits of things of thoughts, of actions, of different things, of putting on certain clothes and like, I was so home in my body, even just a certain vest. I just felt the woman that I was and it was so beautiful, so beautiful. And I was at home in myself. Just going back a little bit, I have, um, I have suffered a number of traumas. Um, there's bipolar depression, anxiety and other things, physical illnesses. But my trans, being transgender, being the woman that I am, is not something that came from all of those. It was there way before all of that came. I thought that my depression and anxiety and my darkness and struggle and loneliness in life, I thought it was all coming from the traumas and there's some degree of truth to that. But what I found when I've done some therapy things that I'll share now, is where it's actually the hiding, the not being known, the not being seen, the repressing, that is actually creates a lot of suffering. I was in a very beautiful um, five or six week program with a long weekend at the end called Free To Be. It was about being free to be me with all kinds of different therapeutic processes in a loving community that culminated in a weekend. I hadn't done much of what's called inner child work that was quite popular some time back. And I'd heard about it and thought it'd be really great. And so we did some inner child work on the weekend. And they got us to tap into the child within. And they assumed that, you know, if you had the female appearing body, there's a girl. And if you have a male appearing body, it's a boy. I did that. It didn't always work. I remember going into a really deep place and tapping in, going deep into my intuitive, allowing what bubbles up. And then there was a the little girl and the thriving and shining. Back in those days, I tried to make sense of who I was. And I know Jung talks about we all have feminine and masculine and trying to put it all down. My femininity was just that kind of thing being expressed. Um, and there is truth to that. But it was way more than just that. We also did a, it was one of the first times I'd done a visualization exercise where they had us go into under a waterfall to go down through, through the bush, come to the waterfall. It's refreshing for us to get under the waterfall, to feel all of the stresses, the problems, the aches, the pains of life, the sufferings to get under and just have the refreshing water at whatever temperature was right to just be cleansing us and washing it away. You know, it didn't work. It didn't work. I tried to visualize, I tried to make it work. It didn't work. And then all of a sudden, I was a woman under the waterfall. Oh, the peace, the relaxation, the coming to life, the softness, the wonder of it all. It's another one of those that I remember it like yesterday. And that was a time where it was bing, 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 bing. The bells were going off. All of the jigsaw pieces of my life coming together. It was so beautiful. So beautiful. It was a real coming back together and a coming home to myself. I went to a um, place in Sydney where you can do deep psychotherapy for 
addictions, for depression, anxiety, relationship problems, all kinds of things. And while I was in our group, we were doing some inner child work. And so I brought up in group and I shared with what was going on. And the therapist said to me, this is a place that's very holistic and the staff here were very accepting. I'm willing to work for you, with you, but I don't know if this is a safe place for you. And I don't know that that's something that we can really offer for you here. And I said to her, I trust you and I want to do it. There is still in our society, um, I just noticed my clock has stopped. So I just need to get my time so I know how to go. Yeah. So I'll just finish up in a few minutes. I was sent to the Gender Centre in Sydney and I learned how incredibly dangerous it was in our society back in the in the 90s and before. The violence, the getting thrown out of homes, out of work, the lack of social support, the extreme expense to do transition surgeries and things. And it was very much in those days about doing all of the physical, changing the sexual organs, doing the surgeries and everything. And that takes a healthy bottle at a lot of money. And I've had neither of those in my life. So I thought, I can't say that I'm transgender. I can't say I'm a woman because I don't have the body or passing or life experience. I can't say a man because I'm not. I was desperately lonely. But in my art therapy course, let's go many years, I decided I have to just find a way to be at peace as who I am in this body, in this world. And I thought that's what I was doing. But I did some art therapy training some years ago. And we did a process that was painting, what is it that we hide that people don't know about us? That's our secrets. We didn't have to share it if we didn't want. It was self-knowledge and self-expression. I shared with my classmate. She loved me. She delighted in who I was. She accepted my story. I felt so safe and I shared it all. And at the end of it, more than anything in my whole life, the deep pain and darkness inside me just lifted. But the next day and the next week and two weeks later, it was still gone. No drugs, no therapy has ever done anything like what happened in that 20 minute session. I told my classmates and it was like a wall of loneliness that I've carried my whole life went. And I've had lots of friends, but I had this big wall. The most amazing thing happened when I was seen, loved, accepted and safe being who I am. Since then, my life has been liberated in my psyche, in my emotions and in my healing. But in the outside world, it gets very scary. And I have to hide for my own safety and protection and well-being. And it really hurts to hide, to not be seen and known. Imagine you spending your life where you've got to hide that you're a woman or a man and pretend to be the other thing. And when you give it away a little bit, some people pounce. It's been really hard. But what has been liberating for me is where I have safe people. Like my counsellor, the first day I went there and said, I'm sick of talking about who's inside. I want to speak for myself. And I dressed up and I spoke for myself and my counselling has been so different ever since. The work that I do with compassion and caring with people in groups is so much more better now that I'm not freezing and hiding who I am inside. I've had guys say to me in therapy groups, say, I would have been, I was an alpha male. I am an alpha male, one guy said, and my world would be so cruel to you and I would have been part of it. But I had no idea until I heard your story. And I'm so sorry for the way I was. And I'm an ally for you and people like you. And he said, I don't hug anybody. And every time we met, he'd come and hug. I've had that many times. But being someone that can't afford for health-wise, money-wise, 
doesn't have the way that can easily pass in our world. I'm coming out all the time. Every new group, there's somebody there. How will they cope with me? How will they deal with me? How will they treat me? But what makes my life thrive and shine is where I have safe sanctuaries. With you as a teacher, or you as a social worker, you as a counsellor, you as a community person, that I know I'm safe with you and you don't make everything about me being transgender, but I'm just a beautiful human being with gifts, that I'm not a problem. When I have those people, it is like I've got a little haven, heaven sanctuary. When I have that classroom where I learn, where I go and do art therapy one day a week at a private hospital where it's my safe place, I thrive and shine and that helps carry. I have my home where I'm loved and accepted for who I am. This is what the kids need. This is what the teenagers need. This is what the adults need. To help us to be who we are, but not to make it all about that. I don't want every time someone sees me or see me as I'm the transgender woman and how's being a transgender going and talking about genitals and surgeries and all of this kind of thing. I love it when I can just be another beautiful human being that's different, like we're all different, has similarities like we're all the same, where I can just be safe and thrive and shine. We want our kids to thrive and shine in school and in the community. In our workplaces, we don't want people walking on eggshells like I often would have to do, hoping that I'm not going to be pounced on. Am I safe here or there? But a workplace, if they want people to thrive, Treat them with dignity and decency. Don't see me as a problem to solve. I have my own problems, but I'm not the problem to solve. But see me as someone with gifts, because each one of us has gifts. Transgender people have beautiful gifts of sensitivity, of being able to see the world through different shoes. Um, so many different gifts. That's probably enough for now. I could tell lots more. But um, thank you for looking beyond the surface, just seeing into my heart and soul. That's what we as transgender people want to see in our world. And that's actually what I think all of us would love to have. And I'm with you in creating that for you and creating it for our world where it is safe for more and more. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. That's so beautiful. You're so generous as ever in sharing your own heart and story with us. And I know there's a lot of appreciation I can see coming through the chat box there for you. Not only happy birthday messages, but also very heartfelt thanks. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions of either Annie or M about this conversation about inclusivity or about anything that they've shared? Um, because we're a smallish group, if you want to just put your hand up and I'll just ask you to unmute, feel free to ask directly. If you can put your camera on, it would be so lovely to see you as well if you did want to ask a question. I know some of you are having trouble with the internet and it's hard to have a camera on, but if you are, that would be lovely to see you. Does anyone have any questions for Annie or Em or both? Um, Grace, yeah. Would you like to unmute? Thank you. Um, I would like to ask a, a question to Em and thank Annie for her tips, how to make, um, you know, um, clients from different cultural backgrounds I feel welcome and safe and Em, how would you um, feel like or know in advance that for instance my practice welcomes everyone no matter the gender uh, sexual orientation cultural background language of course limited to the language that I can speak and understand um, what tips could you give me as a practitioner Please. Mm. When I, my dad went into the nursing home, I loved that the nursing staffs came in and said to us, we will do our best to care for you, but you have your own ways and your own needs. Could you please teach us? I was so touched about that way to work with people, to work with clients. And so that can be with what name? And, um, you know, on paper, we can have all kinds of names. You know, for me, it could be Emily, Emma, Em. What's the official one? But what would you like me to call you? And what pronouns would you like me to use? And some will just be like, 
you know, he or she or whatever, that's, that's cool. But um, you're giving a welcoming gift to someone like me to say, I know that there is diversity and you are welcoming with me. I would know straight away that I'm safer with you just for asking that kind of thing. And it doesn't have to just be specifically checking is a transgender person or not, but that's the kind of thing to go with around so many different things. Thanks, Em. Thanks for that question, Grace. Well, we might use this time that we have left to, um, to go into groups just for five minutes. And there'll be one or two other people in there. And this is an opportunity to reflect and to share what it is that you've gained what it is you've learned, what you've been inspired by in what Annie and Emma have shared with us today about inclusive practice. And even if there's one thing that you might be able to do differently or to do more of, what that might be. So I'll see you back in five minutes. We deal with a lot of diversity in my sort of mental health industry where I'm in as a counsellor, support worker, and as a support coordinator as well. So um, it's all about that genuine, um, openness of a non-judgmental environment, a safe environment for everyone, you know, and it's not something you can fake, it's not something you can sort of make up, you know, you either really care, you really want to listen to understand, not to, not to reply, you really want to sort of make that person feel that they um, equal to anyone in this world, you know, and I think that's the the balance you as a counsellor needs to find, you know, is to sort of, you know, let that people really feel that they sort of, um, you know, are just one of us, you know, yeah. we've got our ups and our down days and all that sort of stuff. And, yeah. and once people understand that we're all just the same, we all got different masks on, you know, and then they sort of open up towards you and you can just talk one language thing. And that's about yeah. caring and love and understanding and, Thanks, Chris. I think that's absolutely right. And I think you've summarised with those reflections so much of what was at the heart of what both Annie and Em were able yep. to share with us today. So thank you, thank you very much for that. Um, what thank I'd like you. to do, I know we've only got a few minutes before we finish up today. I'd like to just do a couple more things before we wind up. One is just to um, let you know that we've just got a little giveaway that I'd like to offer you in just a moment. And also to let you know of the two next free webinars that we have coming up in this holding space series. Um, the woman presenting the Hunter Heartbeat Workshop um, is an incredible drama therapist, uh, incredible dramatist, and she's won an MBE uh, that was awarded to her in the UK. And she's going to be presenting on using sensory games for autistic individuals and their families. That's in two weeks. And in a month, we've got a fabulous supervisor who's going to be talking about supervision as a super meeting of visionaries. So if you're available for either of those and would like to attend for free, please do register and we'll send you the login. I, I would like to especially thank again, Annie Aram Shin, for your great reflections and insights and sharing with us today. And Em as well, um, particularly as it's your birthday, Em Christelle. So thank you for being here and I wish you all well and I hope you all continue to, um, in Em's words, thrive and shine in your practices and in your personhood and in being as inclusive as we can all be for those around each of us. So wishing you all a wonderful day and look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you for being here. Bye now.